Candice, welcome. Yes, hi, Mark. I am so glad that you were able to uh, arrange for this video chat with us. Um, as you know, we are in the midst of the coronavirus lockdown, and I would like to have had you up here to Northeastern Pennsylvania once again. I remember when we first met, it was at the mm -hmm. Oosterhout Free Library, and you did this fantastic presentation on powwow. Oh, thank now, you. And it was well packed. I mean, it was amazing how many people were there, and you kept their attention the whole time. I enjoyed it so much. And when I was looking for someone to speak about Pennsylvania German folklore for our conference, I immediately thought of you, and I'm so glad you're here. So let's have a, a discussion about uh, your topic now. It's a long one. I just remember part of the title, but it's great. It's about holy terror, natural and supernatural terrors from the Middle Ages to the colonial period or to the present? To, the, to early America. Wonderful. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about it. Tell us about what we should be afraid of that goes bump in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> well, first let me tell you a little bit why I'm doing this, because um, it's sort of an odd topic. It's an odd topic on many levels. Um, I, I am the curator of collections for the Schwenkfelder Library and Heritage Center in Pennsburg here in Montgomery County. And um, the Schwenkfelders had some interesting traditions of copying um, printed material uh, from earlier periods. Uh, and among these printed pieces, these broadsides that I'll discuss more in the presentation, um, were Ab about portents of disaster that were um, signs of God's wrath on humanity and um, how these were interpreted and what people should do in order to um, prevent the, the terrible cataclysms that would happen as a result of these heavenly signs and um, other kinds of phenomena. Um, uh, and in particular, one that the Schwenkfelders were interested in was a miraculous fish that was seen over the course of several centuries in Europe. So that's chapter one of my presentation is this miraculous fish. Um, it, it's a very involved sort of ridiculous kind of thing. And I hope that um, the, the attendees are both entertained and informed by that section. And the second is something people probably know a little bit more about, which was um, fear of comets and other kinds of atmospheric phenomenon. Uh, this was a very common topic of broadsides in, uh, from the 16th century all the way into the 19th century in Europe and America. And it also was something some of the Schwenkfelders were interested in. Uh, so that's chapter two of my presentation. Um, I'm, I also tell our attendees a little bit about the Schwenkfelders because I know that many people will not have any idea who these people are. And um, it's interesting that they in particular were interested in these kinds of um, printed pieces about these kinds of um, phenomena, um, probably in part because they had sort of a pietistic leaning, which was a, a movement in the 17th and 18th century in Protestantism, um, which was very much about living a, a pious, God-fearing life, um, so you would get your final reward in heaven, pretty much. Um, and I think that in part, that may have in part inspired the Schwenkfelders to be interested in this material. Um, but frankly, I'm not really sure, but I hope that everyone gets something out of this because it, 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 it's a fascinating topic. Um, uh, let's see. Okay. So. <laughs> well, well, you're sort of prophetic then because not only uh, do we have portents of virus, but we have comets coming by too. So you, you are prophetic yeah, in your choice of topic. it's definitely prophetic material, definitely. Maybe you could tell folks a little bit about the Schwenkfelders. We can, I don't want to say get them out of the way, but just give them as the setup because while they are interesting, they are just but one group of pietists that were prominent in Central Europe, uh, Central Eastern Europe, and then of course in Southeastern Pennsylvania. And uh, pietism was a, a, a variety of mystical they often called the 
uh, left wing of the Reformation group. Uh, they right. were really mm -hmm. outside of traditional Protestantism, which meant they were Definitely. very far outside traditional Catholicism. And they were an extremely esoteric group. And we see connected to them, uh, not always directly, but indirectly as well as directly, uh, different esoteric movements, including Rosicrucianism, uh, both in yeah. a formal sense, uh, such as the Order of the Mustard Seed, and the informal sense, such as just a general occult milieu uh, that would have permeated their culture. So astrology, meditation, devotions, and peculiar yeah. devotions too, some very radical ones, um, some ritual magic, even in some small groups, uh -huh. and I believe even some uh, sexual magic uh, with, uh, with the Moravians at that time. Oh, uh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, people are really unfamiliar. The, the Moravians were some really swinging hippie dudes for that time. Yes, they were. They uh, were. <laughs> yeah, and our Schwenkfelders, um, uh, they sort of, sort of walked on the fringes of that. Um, they were very much, they, they call themselves the middle road. Um, and I go into this a little bit in the presentation, but um, just very quickly, they were followers of a, a theologian named Kaspar Schweinfeld, who was from Lower Silesia, which is now part of Poland. And he And that very is where my family and my wife's family comes from. Oh, really? Oh, as when it was Silesia or Poland? When it was uh, the part of the West Prussian Empire. Okay. Wow. Well, yeah, and so these folks also came from Lower Silesia, and their, um, Sch what Schwenkfeld um, espoused was a, um, a, a, a coming to your faith through a spiritual experience. So there was definitely some sort of mysticism there, but not in the sense as, as some of the other groups say, like the woman of the wilderness and, and and the effort of people and those kinds of things were involved with. It was a uh, much more um, it, internal, very personal relationship that you would have with God and Christ um, that Schwenkfeld was teaching. And um, so this, this made him a very difficult character for some of the reformers who were his contemporaries like Martin Luther to stomach and got him into a lot of trouble. Um, but, and I talk a little bit about that in the presentation. So, so these individuals were his followers. The Schwenkfelders were his followers who um, uh, decided in the 18th century that they could no longer tolerate the persecution they had been suffering since uh, Schwenkfeld's lifetime in the 16th century and found an opportunity to come to Pennsylvania and um, make their new homes here. And we still have um, three existing Schwenkfelder churches today, but they're very much mainstream Protestant churches. Uh, you would see very little of the hints of Schwenkfeldianism as it was in the um, 18th century, 17th, 18th century. Uh, it, it really doesn't exist anymore, but where it does exist is in the heritage of these people. It's, even though it's a small group, even in Europe, there weren't many more than 1,500 or so. It's extraordinarily small, but they have a very strong sense of their heritage and where they came from, the Schwenkfelders of today. So we do manage to preserve here in Pennsburg, Pennsylvania, their very rich cultural heritage, spiritual and intellectual heritage. They were quite advanced intellectually among the Pennsylvania Germans. Um, they focused on education and literacy more so than many of the other groups. They were more, more in keeping with the Mennonites in that way, who also had that strong focus. Um, but the Schweinfelders, I also should add, were not Anabaptists. They did not fall under that umbrella. Um, well, let's, let's just, for folks who are new to this, uh, just let's point out that it is interesting to hear uh, that, of course, uh, the Lutheran Church at this time did have its own uh, persecution, or at least, we'll say, strong rejection of some movements. Martin Bima, or, uh, or Jacob Bima. Jacob Bima was uh, ostracized by the Lutheran Church, and of course, he was strongly influential in the, well, the foundation of the Beminist movement, but strongly influential in the Pietist movement in different areas. Pietism itself, or should we say Anabaptism, is a rejection of infant baptism, saying that you have to come to 
uh, Christ as an adult and be baptized mm -hmm. in his adult for so folks who understand. And that there are many groups here, and this is where it can get very confusing. So even in a small area like southeastern Pennsylvania, there were, uh, at least that off the top of my head, I can think of about a dozen different groups and movements, but with just oh, with oh, main, mainstream and, and, and so what was, what, what is it that made the Schwenkfelders unique? And just for the listeners or the or people watching this, there, the Germans did not, were not isolated from Europe. Uh, it only took about two to four weeks to get some of the newest published materials from Europe to here. Uh, so if they wait, or two months, I mean, one to two months. So if they wanted new books, uh, they could often get them and stay somewhat uh, intellectually abreast. So they would yeah. only be a few months behind. Yes, and if it, it, our library is, is great proof of that, of, of books that they acquired after the immigration. They brought things with them when they immigrated, but they also managed to acquire uh, materials after immigration um, that they use. They had in personal libraries and in, um, they used in their schools. Um, I, my cat may come over. He, <laughs> I knew he'd do this right when I was trying. <laughs> Um, uh, anyway, no. Okay. Um, oh, that's all right. We, we love the animals and, uh, everyone <laughs> here is doing this distance, so that's fine. Um, and I should also say that in Philadelphia with the active German presses, this is where they were getting a lot of this material too, that the, 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 the printers in German in, in Philadelphia were able, and Germantown, were able to get this material from Germany and then distribute it here in, in uh, widely in Pennsylvania. And that's where I believe our Schwenkfelders got a lot of the source material for um, these unusual, uh, the miraculous fish and the, and the he heavenly signs, all that kind of material, I think they got from these uh, Philadelphia printers. Well, let's jump into that because I know that you've prepared a, uh a slideshow, a PDF presentation for folks who they can watch along with this or afterwards. Uh, but let's, let's get to some of these questions because this creates an interesting dichotomy for us. On one hand, we have a group of people who are actively involved in their community. Uh, they're uh, intellectually astute. Uh, they are not like some of the other groups. And I think in this case, we would maybe look at the Amish uh, who uh, fundamentally rejected anything of the world. And therefore for them, learning consisted fundamentally only of the Bible uh, some uh, early uh, pr primers to learn how to read and write and mm -hmm. to just to get by in daily life. There was no need for other things. And, and what else they needed, they would go outside the community for and then go back into their own world. Uh, yeah. So here we, here we have a group, and, and they're still like that today. So we have a group who's actively involved in, in cultivating the intellectual life, and yet they carried forth these medieval ideas, what many which we would consider fears and superstitions. So maybe we could get into that. What were some of those ideas from the Middle Ages they carried over? Well, and I, I know, and I find this very puzzling. Um, so that's why I'm not sure why they, why they were copying this material, this prophetic material that does come down. Well, the, the, the heavenly signs material has ancient roots and the, the, miraculous fish in the late 16th century. Um, so I'm not sure why, because I think they knew better. <laughs> I, I think they did. I, um, many of them were even acquainted with David Rittenhouse, our great Pennsylvania German astronomer. I mean, well, for me, he's a household name, maybe not for the whole world, but um, uh, so th they actually knew him personally. So well, they knew well, let's what just he, say, was he was doing. Let's just say Rittenhouse was also was an astrologer. He did hor horoscopes. Indeed. So, yeah, Indeed. so just to kind of keep it culturally correct, you know, he, he was doing astrology and was doing horoscopes at the time, which were fairly widely done. I think he did, uh, he did quite a few of them uh, and for the, the German community as well. And the English yeah, that, that, right. that alone is a strange, you know, you just don't know quite what to make of that because it seemed to be true of so many of the astronomers and the um, Johann Jakob Zimmermann um, too of, of the 17th century. So um, yeah, it's, I, and, and 
I'm not sure what the Schweinfelders were thinking. There's no definite proof that they actually believed in this material that they were copying. I'm not so I'm not sure if they were doing it because it was it, in some way it intrigued them. It captured their imagination. When you see the images of the fish in um, in the presentation, and I should say, as a, a museum curator, I try to be a good historian and a um, but I'm at heart a museum curator, so I'm always looking at the objects. And my questions are always about where the objects came from, where, where, where ideas originated, where words originated, where the objects originated. And so I may have backed myself into a corner here. So, um, so what what just intrigued me was finding the roots of these these uh, drawings that the Schwenkfelders were making. Why were they doing this? Um, uh, but did they really believe it? I don't know. I just can't answer that. I haven't found out anything definitive. <laughs> what are some of the images that you've provided for us that you'd like us to pay careful attention to? Uh, maybe give us some examples so when we go through it, we'll keep an eye out for them. Oh, well, first of all, I should say in the, um, in the presentation, you will encounter um, a, many photos of um, Fraktur, which are German language decorated manuscripts and drawings um, for those uh, who are attending who do not know. Um, the Schwenkfelder Library and Heritage Center has one of the best, if not the best, collection of Fraktur in the country, if not the world. And I only say that because our Fraktur collection came directly from the families of the Schwenkfelders who originally owned these pieces. So instead of having a collector um, picking and choosing what he or she wants in their collection, instead, we just had the whole pile. You know, whatever came out of the chest is what we got. And um, it shows then a really good chronology of these decorated manuscripts. Um, they were in terribly important to the Schwenkfelders as teaching tools. If any of the rest of the attendees are Pennsylvania German, which I hope there are some, um, they might know Fraktur from um, uh, documents called Geburts und Taufschein, which are birth and baptismal certificates, which are the most common types of Fraktur. But the Schwenkfelders, because they did not practice infant baptism, that was another part of their, um, of their tradition, uh, they instead used Fraktur for its other purpose, which was teaching children and, and young people. Um, so basically, we have these masterpieces pieces of folk art, as some people choose to call them, I don't always think of them as that, um, that were used to teach children <laughs> and were made by men, predominantly schoolmasters or some or pastors in some cases, and distributed th uh, by these men to their students or done as um, uh, a little side gig, a side hustle of making these frock tour um, for for communities. Um, the golden age of frock tour was probably somewhere just after the Revolutionary War, maybe mid-Revolutionary War, to about 1835 when the Free Public School Act uh, began to gradually take over the subscription type schools that had existed in Pennsylvania before that time. After that, after, after the Public School Act came about, there was really no more need for this frock tour uh, in the German language and also marked sort of a sad decline of um, that part of our Germanic culture. Um, so when you're looking at the, get, getting back to the presentation, looking at these images, they come from this tradition of Pennsylvania German decorated manuscripts, or German language, I should say more accurately, decorated manuscripts. Um, and um, and the, the group of fish pieces are particularly wonderful and um, 
I hope that you'll pay close attention to them because they're really incredible, in my opinion. <laughs> well, I, I have something here. Can, do you have a camera? Can, can you see? I think, yeah. This is a modern. Oh, yeah, uh, I see it. Oh, great. Thanks for showing that. Just to give the, the a preview of something better, because this is wonderful, but the folks are going to see something even better. You know, yeah. Maybe you could just give us an example of what is it that uh, in the belief system of the Schwenkfelders, in that personal, I, I, two things come to mind. One is that in the personal relationship to, to God, uh, yes. it is very personal. It's not what is your personal relationship to Jesus? Uh, what kind of, dis uh, were they Trinitarian in nature? Or what kind of, how, how did they set up their, their theological framework in that regard? Oh dear, that may be too much for me to answer <laughs> without consulting uh, something. Uh, that particular question is, is probably outside of my wheelhouse at the moment. <laughs> oh, well, fine. Then tell us what they were afraid of and why. <laughs> <laughs> what they were afraid of. Um, I, I think that if you look at the surviving material, I, like I said, as a curator, I, I tend to look at things, I tend to look at the objects, and especially the frock tour. And what they keep telling me, the frock tour in particular, is that idea that you should lead a blameless life so you get your ultimate reward. That's a very significant part of um, what they believe. So, and, and they, that seemed to be something they followed no matter what. It, you see it through the 18th century and into the 19th century that they always held fast to that kind of motto. They came in many different forms, but it was really, um, it, it was really earning your place in heaven to some extent, I would say. That may not be quite accurate, um, but I think that's a good answer. There's a, there's a very um, famous motif that shows up in both Mennonite and Schwenkfelder frock tour and needlework that's called the O Edelherz bedanke dein end. And it means, O noble heart, consider thy end. Um, so, and, and you see that into about 1840. So that's one thing I think they were very concerned about. They were not fire and brimstone people by any means. It was, um, it was, and it was very much um, also not, um, they they weren't they weren't interested in outward ritual. I already mentioned infant baptism, but they also didn't. Um, one of the things that separated Schwenkfeld from the other reformers in the 16th century was that he decide he and his colleagues and like-minded individuals decided to cease the celebration of communion. Um, which the Schwenkfelders followed and did until 1877. So they also were not interested in outward shows. They were, they were not especially, they weren't plain people, but they were very conservative and humble people as well. Um, they believed in, in that humility, that that was um, uh, uh, the, the path that you should follow to an extent. Um, yeah. So I hope that is, is that helpful? <laughs> oh, I think very much so, because we're trying to put it into context. Uh, it's uh, particularly today's contemporary spiritual environment, and, and we would go everywhere from uh, New Age movement to various uh, magical and esoteric groups to various uh, uh, Christian denominations of super churches uh, to Roman Catholicism with its various revival movements, revival in the sense like... Uh, its, its own internal charismatic movements, all the way through, throughout the whole spectrum of what is available in the spiritual marketplace today is quite stunning. Uh, so when we come across these organizations or these movements, I should say, and groups of people who are really looking for a direct communion, a direct path to God, they've come together, they have common core beliefs, but essentially it is about what is my direct personal understanding of deity and my relationship to it. Uh, that is something that sometimes is hard to wrap our head around. Because the closest we can grasp is, you know, get right with God or get right with Jesus. And, and that, does, that, that sounds similar, 
but it is not the same thing. Mm -hmm. yeah, they weren't fundamentalist in the way we would think of that today. Um, no, no, not at all. Although by the 20th century, that sort of rolled around into it, but certainly the 18th and 19th century, they, they were not. And, and interestingly, um, they, because Schwenkfeld himself wasn't really interested in these outward shows of faith, um, even though study of the Bible was important to him, he believed, as I said in the beginning, that this, that your faith did not come from those things, that it was this personal spiritual experience that, and, and that, that is what brought you to your faith. I think it's interesting that when we look back at the Pennsylvania German groups, even the pietist groups that survived, so many of them, because of their simplicity, and this is the only rationale I can understand, because of their simplicity, as they moved forward into the 19th, into the early 20th, into the 20th century, many of them became what we think of as modern Baptist or fundamentalist or um, I want charismatic would do, be the word, but uh, these other kinds of extremely conservative Christianity that we ta tend to think of today, they moved into that on some level or, or completely, that they really transformed away from their roots uh, in that respect. Sure, yeah, and, and that is definitely what happened among the Schwenkfelders. And as I said, that the Schwenkfelders today um, they bear no resemblance to the Schwenkfelders of yore. <laughs> or with the Moravians. They're very uh, mainstream Protestants. So <laughs> if, you, if you're a member of, a, say, the United Church of Christ, which actually some of the Schwenkfelder churches, are, two of them are affiliated with, you would see very little difference in the Schwenkfelder church than the United Church of Christ. And, and just to put this in context, I mean, we, we, a lot of folks think they're very cutting edge today with the uh, their study of uh, uh, Tibetan Buddhism and some of its imagery or, or Indian Tantra and some of its imagery, but you know, just to sidestep into like the Moravians, uh, a lot of the imagery there of the, the bleeding wounds of Christ, uh, some distinct sexual imagery and the sexual practices uh, were very radical now, uh, let alone back then. And yet they, they weren't exactly alone in that. So there was a wide spectrum, a wide uh, spectrum of spiritual practices going on in our little southeastern corner of Pennsylvania, all, all the way up to not quite where I'm at, but almost, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, 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 who, who is the, the Graf von Zinzendorf? He, uh, yeah, 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 Christian. He, yeah, he made, it up, uh, he made it up my way. He made it up to about yeah. a mile from where my great-grandmother was born. So he's, he made it up to about, I guess, about nine or eight, eight or nine miles from where I'm sitting. Uh, and he had his Order of the Mustard Seed, which was a quasi-Rosicrucian group, uh, which he started out as almost as a joke, really, but then became a serious enterprise after a while. So the wide spectrum of activities, what I want our, our viewers to understand, some fascinating stuff was going on. It is, it is. Oh. What would you like our uh, viewers to really take away from this? And, although, and we also encourage them uh, to get down and see you uh if yes. possible so and we're gonna oh Go and ahead. actually when we reopen we will be reopening with a much larger institution we are in the midst of finishing up a building project um where we added an addition a very large addition and gallery space and brought a uh, 19th century barn onto the property in Pensburg. Um, so for a very small group of people, <laughs> we have a very large institution that people can visit with much gallery space and extensive collections. So yes, and uh, oh, what was the other part of the question? I'm sorry. Well, you know, I just, as I just want to sidestep into something here. Maybe many years ago, I was down in uh, Philadelphia. I was with some uh, some of the leading uh, historians of esotericism and spirituality, names all of the uh, listeners would recognize. We were walking down the street looking for a place to go to lunch, and they were talking back and forth about, well, you know, where do you find your stuff, and where do you find to write about? Because so they're saying, you know, the, the great libraries in Europe have been really heavily combed over. They, they've pretty much 
what has been cataloged is going to be cataloged, although there is an exception. And they all admitted that, you know, these small uh, local uh, historical societies and organizations such as yours are where, except for one, the lawyer said, uh, uh, everybody sued somebody at some point. So I just look to see that <laughs> it's all been entered into evidence. I, I go look at the law record. But they agreed that wonderful, wonderful facilities and folks like yourself who are dedicated to this uh, have just great resources and, and want to thank you for it. The other question was, um, what would you really like us to take away from this whole presentation after we're done watching it? I think what I would like the visitors to see is how far back, or the attendees or the listeners, how far back these concepts that came to um, the colony of Pennsylvania with our German immigrants, how far the roots went back. I, I just find it fascinating. Um, as I said, I, I'm all about origins. I, I love to find the roots of, of, of these objects and ideas and words and what have you. And even though this is a small little niche kind of um, topic that probably doesn't have a great deal of impact on what people are thinking today. I, I think that we still, I, I mean, with the virus, I saw news reports of the virus that, that um, journalists were talking to end of world folks, asking them if they believe that the virus was part of the end of the world prophecies. Um, <laughs> oh. So this is still, in, in many ways, these kinds of prophetic materials are still very alive today. Um, fear of comets, uh, the, the Heaven's Gate cult that, I, I don't remember how long ago that was, 30 years ago? Do you remember, Mark? The oh, Gate geez, you know, I, I think that was at least 20, probably closer to 30. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and that and that was all wrapped up in in this comet um, yeah, prophecy, the the mass suicide of the Heaven's Gate people. Well, that um, raises the question. Uh, um, many of the groups that came to southeastern Pennsylvania, particularly the Pietists, like those who uh, surrounded themselves around Johannes Kelpius, uh, woman in the wilderness. Uh, I believe uh, even uh, Beisel, yeah. Beisel, who came yeah. in search of him and couldn't find him, and went out and, se and settled. Uh, what is now Ephrata, which is a wonderful place to visit. We had Nick Siegert here last uh, year who presented on them. Absolutely. Some feminist work. Uh, were the Schrenkfelders uh, what we would call in modern terms apocalyptic? No, 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 not in the least bit. Not even the ones that skewed a little more mystical, um, which there were some, not many, and it was early on. It was in the colonial period. Um, uh, they, but they never seem to go down that road. However, and another interesting sidelight, if you ever want me to do this talk, <laughs> there were Schwenkfelders who were involved with the, um, the ap apocalyptic uh, public universal friend, if you're familiar with her. Are you familiar with her? Jemima oh. Wilkinson, the public oh, universal I, friend. Yeah, I know the name. Yes, yeah, I, the I don't know the story. Century, she, mm -hmm. she lured, I, and I shouldn't say that like that, but somehow she managed to get a group of our Schwenkfelders from Worcester Township in Montgomery County, not only to financially support her, but to um, follow her to New York State and the founding of her community. Well, it wasn't really a community, but people who supported her and tended to all of her needs at New Jerusalem in oh, Yates County. Yes, yes. I think yes, and this is another one of my faves. But so those Schwenkfelders, but they had already sort of left the fold. Um, uh, they had sort of turned to Methodism. This was in the 1780s and early 1790s. They had turned to Methodism and then they were sort of like, um, uh, fodder for her she could just scoop them up because they were already on the way out so but um so anyway our schwankfelders had to do with the founding of penn yan new york pennsylvania where our schwankfelders and yankees from connecticut and massachusetts and rhode island were the yan part so 
So that's, <laughs> so they're the only ones I could think of, but they're sort of the big exception to the rule. I, I have to check. I think Jocelyn Godwin wrote about them in his book, Upstate Cauldron. I, I have I'm to sure they, they are fascinating or she is fascinating. Mm -hmm. And the whys and wherefores of the people who followed her is hard to sort out, but also very interesting what we do know about them. Well, and for us, and I think for all of our, our participants, uh, spirituality is a wonderful thing. And we, we come to understand ourselves better. And, and hopefully there's a practical aspect of self-awareness and self-realization and bringing that into the world and, and that we bring value for it. However, it can be terribly boring, and it is wonderful to have these scoundrels every now and then to help um, oh. and, uh, make, make things a little more exciting, especially in oh. hindsight when there's someone else's. Oh, know. they're the most fun. And she, she um, and I, like I said, a lot of people taught, try to defend her, and I shouldn't, in, in today's um, being careful with pronouns, I shouldn't be using she, I should be using they, most likely, um, because she dressed as a man, presented as a man, um, and now today people believe that she wanted to be seen as a man. I'm not sure if I totally believe that, but um, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a very complicated situation that, and there was very, very little written documentation to really let us understand who she was. A lot of it was commentary, um, some good, some bad, uh, very little from her actual mouth. So, but that's another story. <laughs> Well, that's a great one, and, and maybe we can do that in a year or two. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah. We, we've, heard, we've had the images of, um, well, before then, we can do a special interview before then. Uh, nothing stopping us except ourselves. We've got the, the images of the fish. We've got, uh, what are some of the other images that appear in the manuscripts? Well, as, as I mentioned, and I, I, should, I should really um, stress this, what really brought a lot of this prophecy and these images to the fore was the broadside culture that started in the um, probably close to the earliest years of mechanical printing. So let's say the late 15th century, we started to see some of these broadsides popping up that had this kind of prophecy, uh, whether it be involved with our fish or comets or other heavenly signs, you'd really see this in the 15th and 16th and then the 17th century, um, where because the uh, uh, these printed pieces were easy to mass produce and they were cheap, and people were hungry for them. There was a very um, uh, uh, good market for this kind of material. So we see tons of these things popping up. And, and that's a very important part of my presentation, this imagery that came from these broadsides. And uh, just so I define broadsides in my um, talk, but for people who don't know about them. They are single sheet printed sheets that serve a purpose either as propaganda or some sort of announcement or or just they can be informational or amusing. A lot of them have ballads uh, that you would sing to a certain tune. Um, and this continued, as I said, uh, from the 15th, the late 15th century well into the 19th century here in the United States. Um, so there's a lot of that imagery and uh, the very poor, important part of our culture were these broadsides, especially our German culture. And they, and they were often uh, pasted on the sides of buildings or walls, if I they remember were. correctly. So, and they were ephemeral. They were not meant to last. So the fact that we have any of this thing, particularly the ones of the fish, that there's so many that still exist from the 16th and, and 17th century is extraordinary to me. Um, uh, because they, somebody just happened to tuck them away somewhere and, and they survived. Because they weren't really meant to. Well, and this is part of uh, the, the wonderful aspects of being a, a historian, particularly of, uh, of beliefs in a way, because we're, we're looking at these objects. We're so glad that we have them. Uh, we're glad to be able to preserve them and to bring them forward and to share them. And yet at the same time, we wonder, what exactly does this mean? Uh, my wife, uh, upon the death of her father last year, uh, finally inherited a, a box full of these uh, letters 
uh, some photographs, mm -hmm. but mostly letters from her mother's side of the family. And inside were uh, wax seals, signet seals on documents oh. from Poland. And uh, oh, she spent mom. a great deal of time trying to find people who knew, not only could read 19th century Polish, uh, but also could uh, explain to her what these things meant. Uh, so it's it, history, even recent history like that, which is really only pushing maybe 100, and, 100 to 120, 130 years. Some of those maybe 160 at most. Uh, even that can be a challenge to us, let alone going back into the 18th, uh, 17th and 16th centuries and earlier. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. And um, I should add too that the it's it's all in the details. Um, you know, the big picture is great, but for me as a curator, I always want to get down to the little nitty gritty. And that's what this presentation is all about. The nitty gritty of what people believed in and things that had had an impact on their lives that are surprising in some way. And um, and I think that is uh, when you were talking earlier about, about their, uh, what's left to research, uh, especially in our Pennsylvania German culture, I think there is so much left. It is a wide open field. So if people are interested, um, having some knowledge of German is helpful. Um, I managed to hobble along, but I also have a German scholar at my disposal. Um, so, but um, there's so much to do. And, you know, people like Patrick Dunmore, who has my complete and utter respect and admiration, he, um, he is still finding these little narrow areas that are so meaningful in so many ways and and um, uh, and others too, but his work right now I think is is very important along those lines, um, but so much of these things are still left to be looked at because um, I should add too especially um, I'm very interested in textiles also, and there's lots of areas um, that were traditionally viewed as the woman's sphere which have not been explored much in, in among the Pennsylvania Germans. So we still have a lot of that to go to. Well, I think we have three problems here in dealing with it, maybe four. Uh, let me just touch upon that textile for a moment. Uh, among the things which my wife had was this uh, fabulous uh, textile. And uh, she, you know, clearly it was at least 100 years old or more. And it was very nice. And uh, she's looking at it and turning it around. And I can see what looks like some uh, writing clearly painting, it was painted on the back, and she can't figure it out. And I turned and I said, that's uh, Lutz. And he said, well, that's Lutz, so Lutz Poland. That's where it came from. Oh, so, oh. So, so she takes some pictures of it, gets on the internet. She ends up emailing the textile museum in Lutz, and they tell her that this is a spectacular piece of work and spent a great deal of time of their time helping her to understand the textile history of Poland at that time and how this would have came into the family, probably, most likely, and over here uh, in the mid or, you know, in the, the 19th century. So the willingness of folks like yourself and others, I, I am always impressed by, I have to tell you, to just help anyone out. And the other issues that we have with this is one is it is local. Uh, people have a tendency to uh, have a certain, uh, I don't want to say it's inferiority complex, but look down on those things which are, are local and uh, are regional. They always want something bigger and better. And, uh, right, right. And, 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 but everything is always local. At the end of the day, it's always right here where we're at. That's why these local historical societies and museums such as yours have so much wonderful stuff. And then on top of it, we have the notion of that the Pennsylvania Germans were a fairly insular group. And then this followed on the anti-German uh, movements of the 19th century and early 20th mm -hmm. centuries. So. There's many areas to go, but I think the most important one is that folk, you said the, the term folk art, uh, it's, looked, it's talked about in a fairly derogatory term. Yeah. Uh, we look at this folkishness as, as uneducated, simple, uh, unworthy of our time, unsophisticated, uh, and we don't really grasp the depths, and this ties into it, to which spirituality played, regardless of their faith, but the depths to which spirituality played every moment of their lives. Uh, agreed. And um, 
yeah, and with Proctor in particular, these decorated manuscripts, um, some may seem naive or, you know, folky as they say, but so much of this material comes from um, some great depth of spiritual knowledge and, and sometimes uh, uh, quite a lot of sophistication and add to that um, their ability their calligraphic ability, which is a major part of it, it's, it can be very sophisticated, as can the designs of the Proctor, particularly those of the late 18th century and 19th century. And, and I just can't abide by the fact that it might be considered naive or, you know, it, it's not. It's, it comes from people with some learning and knowledge uh, beyond their community, let's put it that way. How they came by that learning and knowledge, I'm not always sure, but they certainly had it. Um, so that in particular, I sometimes take issue with. It just depends on how, where the frock tour came from maybe, or what the imp imp impetus was for it. Um, but certainly so much of ours, I, I can't just say this is folk art and leave it at that. I can't do that. <laughs> well, Stephen Davies, <laughs> who is a professor of religion uh, emeritus at uh, Misericordia, was one of our speakers last year. And about five years ago, he was very helpful to my wife when she was doing a presentation of her paintings uh, that she does uh, Tibetan Buddhist iconography. And uh -huh. uh, she, she's quite skilled at it. And uh, what I've always noticed is that we're kind of spoiled because she is a spectacular artist and is recognized as such. Many of the people who she associates with in that area are skilled. And yet, when you look to what Davies had, he had this amazing collection of almost like baseball card sized uh, initiation cards, which were the Tibetan oh. thing. So where did you get these from? He said, oh, I, I get them online. Well, how? He goes, well, they're mostly Mongolian. So he gets them from, you know, at that time, Mongo uh, Mongolia. But if you look at them, uh, especially when you're looking at the real thing, as you know, when you're looking at it, you're holding it in your gloved hands and you're looking at it, uh, they're often not well done. They're not pretty. They're often hard to tell what they are. There's only maybe one or two symbols that give them away. But the intensity and the fervency of faith and a belief, because the person could do this or they could do that. Yeah. And I don't think we understand the choices that were involved in taking time out of their day or their life to engage in this kind of practice. The, the, the fracture script is very difficult to do. It is a highly sophisticated calligraphy. Yeah. Uh, so for the folk, and, and it, we won't just say it's a German thing to get it all perfect. There's more to it than that. This is a, an act of faith. Absolutely. And it seems to be, um, among the Schwein colors, this is a little sidelight, and it actually doesn't have anything to do with Frochter, but it does have to do with sort of what you're saying. Part of their process, um, part of their devotions appeared to be copying and recopying manuscripts um, uh, that, um, uh, by Schwenkfeld. They may have had one printed copy, and they were used to doing this because of the, um, uh, they they may not have had access to more printed copies than one, say among several families. So maybe they pr maybe the copying was out of a practic out of practicality that they needed another copy. But it also seemed to be some sort of spiritual exercise. Sort of what you're saying is that they were um, copying and recopying as uh, as part of their faith practice. Um, we have. So many of these, I cannot begin to tell you, that date from the 17th century um, uh, up until probably the early 19th, but then seemed they, that sort of faded away after that. Well, that's fascinating because we have several things that work there. We have a form of uh, a yoga or a union, a meditative yoga work there of, of study, uh, of uh, intellectual practice, but not as we typically think. Uh, of study and memorization, but of absorption, the contemplative absorption that goes yes, on as one absolutely. is involved in studying. And I, I myself have many notebooks. I have one sitting next to me right here. And uh, these are from things that I have uh, attended or things that I've done 
and uh, they aid me a great deal in understanding things. And I'll transcribe them later. I'll type them up and, and use those for practical purposes. But the physical book, that active, engaged, engaging the whole body and the mind and the senses in that aspect of writing is a form of meditative absorption that uh, many people have lost today. That is a wonderful description and actually exactly what I think they were doing. We don't know exactly, I don't think, we just assume that that is what they were doing because of the sheer volume of this copied material that exists. And I shouldn't say it was just men, it was men and women who were doing it. Um, so it was obviously something that went across gender, um, that it was important for women to know these things as well as, as men. Well, that's really important because that sets them apart from, and you know, uh, let's say the Amish, where things are yeah. again, at, a, at a much lower level. Things are very functionally oriented. Uh, it sets them apart from quite a few organ, a few of the other uh, religious movements at the day, in which they're not only engaging men and women in this equal education task because they had to be equally educated to perform it, but also in how they had equal access to this material and were encouraged to involve themselves in internalizing it. Um, I often am remembered of some of the uh, practices in Brauka in which, uh, uh, and this goes back to other areas as well, in which biblical verses are written on paper and then consumed to be internalized as part of the magical practice. And that gets its imagery from the Bible, uh, particularly in Revelations, where John of Patmos has, he's having the vision, and of course he has to eat the scroll, which, um, I think it, is, it goes, it is bitter in my mouth, but honey in my stomach. So it's hard to mm -hmm. take, but it's good for you. But that notion of how do we internalize the word of God uh, is, is the question at work here. And, and their internalization practice was through this uh, contemplative way. Yes, absolutely. Well, this has been a wonderful hour. And boy, it went by very quickly. Oh, an hour. oh my goodness. Yes. yes. So, uh, we, I, is there anything else you'd like to say to folks before we uh, sign off and, and get folks um, so looking at your presentation? I, I don't think so. I will have my um, email address in on one of the slides at the end. Uh, so people can feel free to contact me with comments or criticisms or suggestions or whatever you might have um, about the, the presentation. I would love to hear from anybody who has some thoughts on it. Um, uh, and I hope everyone enjoys it. Um, like I said, it's a niche kind of thing. <laughs> so um, uh, I, I really hope it speaks to some of the attendees or all of the attendees. <laughs> Well, Candice, thank you so very much for taking this You're time welcome. out of your day. And uh, we thank you so much for your work. And I hope to meet you again in person soon. And I hope that everyone takes advantage of this opportunity to contact you and let you know uh, what they got out of your uh, presentation and that they in themselves get involved in it. Maybe not necessarily the Schwenkfelders, but there are so many nearby Pennsylvania German uh, organizations and movements that are involved in this spiritual aspect of the spiritual culture that uh, we share and are a part of and uh, will gladly, I know you will, I will, I know Nick will, will gladly help people find uh, something if they're looking for it because it is such a wonderful area of study and it is under research. So if you're looking to publish a paper or a book, uh, this might be the place to go because there's less competition. Truly, truly. And, and Fractor, Despite all the publications in recent years, um, there's still so much to do. So if people are interested in that, they should definitely explore that. That is, we, I still think we've only touched the tip of the iceberg on that, despite all the publication that has gone on. Um, so, and, and I just wanna add, just in closing to, uh, to everyone, I hope you are all safe and well, and that also, you support your local cultural institutions, especially the small ones. <laughs> yes. And with that, I thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for coming, either now or at some point in the future, because that'll be now for you as well. Uh, because this presentation, as well as all of the others, are perennial. They are evergreen, because they are recorded, and you can access them at any time. So thank you very much. And Candice, thank you for being here. Sure. Thank you.